There are times when events elicit a very strong sense of self that comes out, sometimes with a lot of greed, a lot of lust, anger. And afterwards we regret what we did under the influence of that sense of self. And it's all too easy to say, well, the big problem in my life is my sense of self. What can I do to get rid of it? You have to remember you don't have one sense of self. There are many. You have a whole stable. Everything from common animals up to Brahmas. They're related to different wishes, different desires. We have a desire, and then we need a self as the sense of who's going to be consuming the desired object, or doing the desired thing, or getting the results of the desired action, and then who's going to be doing it. If you're going to act on a desire, you need a sense of self both as a producer and a consumer. This is how we create states of becoming. Because the desire doesn't require only self, it also requires an object that's going to be in a world. You have to figure out how to negotiate, how to navigate that world. And then you figure out which of your senses of self is going to be useful. Now the problem is sometimes they just come jumping out. We do this pretty willy-nilly. And a good part of the practice is learning to be a little bit more selective. Learning how to see these senses of self as actions, they're strategies, strategies for happiness. Just like not-self is a strategy for happiness. Again, not-selfing is something we do all the time. You identify with something and then you decide you don't want to identify anymore. You draw lines. And sometimes these lines are pretty random and pretty chaotic. So we're trying to bring some more order, some more skill into these processes. This is why the Buddha teaches those teachings on the three types of fabrication, because it's through those types of fabrication that we create our becomings, our sense of who we are in a particular world. And the Buddha is full of recommendations on how you can learn how to create new senses of self, develop new skills. Because this is one of the problems. We have a limited range, even though we have many, many times types of self in there. Each of them has a script. And sometimes the scripts are pretty ill thought out. And they're put together in a very haphazard way. Because we're doing a lot of this in ignorance, just grabbing hold of whatever we think we can identify with what would be useful at that time. And finding out later we've grabbed onto burning coals. So what are the Buddha's recommendations? He recommends how to breathe, what kind of feelings to create, what kind of perceptions to hold in mind, how to talk to yourself. The 16 steps in breath meditation are a way to recalibrate your bodily fabrication. Because when an angry self comes up, what does it do? It seizes your breath and does something weird with it. It holds it hostage. As long as you don't give in to me, it'll make your breath really miserable. And so you give in to get it out of your system. And then you've created the karma of acting on anger. So the Buddhists teach you how to seize the breath back. Get sensitive to long breathing, short breathing. Learn how to breathe, aware of the whole body. Learn how to calm bodily fabrication down. Those are the four big steps. It's like the Buddha is sketching out an outline for you. And then the various teachings we get, say, from John Lee and the other Johns on breath meditation, those fill in the outline. How to think about the breath energies in the body, how to play with them. 
These are all instructions on how to do bodily fabrication so you can create more skillful selves. And then same with verbal fabrication. He gives you lots of instructions on how to talk to yourself, what things to hold in mind. Starting with the basic principle that you want to abandon unskillful qualities and develop skillful ones. Just thinking in those terms resets things, recalibrates things. Because it forces you to think about the long term. When I act in this way, when I assume this particular identity, what will happen down the line? And simply seeing it, that identity as an action, that's one of the most important insights the Buddha had. And people back in his time were talking about the self as something either existed or didn't exist. sort of independently of what they could do. And the Buddha said, it's not something you're born with as a given. It's something you create, and you can create new ones. What's really distinctive about the Buddha's teachings is the extent to which karma is the basic context for everything he teaches. And here's another instance. The way you self is a kind of karma. And there, when you think of it in terms of self, it's not a question of your true self versus your false self. It's more a question of which of yourselves is skillful and which ones are not. It's been a lot. So just thinking in those terms, that's how the Buddha is telling you to talk to yourself. So this is a kind of karma. Karma has consequences. Do I want the consequences of this particular kind of action? And as you talk to yourself in terms of the Four Noble Truths, the way you self is a kind of clinging. And when is it useful and when is it not? Because you do need a sense of self to follow the path, a sense of yourself as competent, that you can do this. That's the self as the producer. Then there's the self as the consumer. You're going to benefit from following the path. And you want these to be your main guidelines. And then you start sorting through the whole catalog of selves that you've had. And you try to figure out which ones are useful and which ones are not. And which ones may not necessarily be useful right away, but which ones you can convert. So these are the ways you talk to yourself. And then the, the feelings that you try to create, largely through the way you breathe and through the way you think. And then the perceptions. But the Buddha has lots of perceptions, all those analogies throughout the canon. Those are designed for you to take on as ways of fabricating the state of your mind, fabricating your attitude towards your anger, towards your lust, towards your greed. For example, with lust. The Buddha has all those images for the drawbacks of lust. A bead of honey on a blade of a knife. Borrowed goods. A chain of bones, which all the meat has been boiled away and it's just nothing, nothing left but the bones to chew on. Whereas and John Lee would add, all you get is the flavor of your saliva. There are images for the drawbacks of anger. You remind yourself that when you're angry, you're ugly. You tend to destroy things that are valuable. You please your enemies. Because you do things that you think are in your, to your advantage when they turn out to be just the opposite. These are perceptions, these are ways of thinking to hold in mind. 
the Buddhist teachings are full of recommendations on how to fabricate a new sense of self, new states of becoming, as part of the path. And of course, as with all fabrications, there will come a point where you let these go too. But it's not a case where you simply just drop your sense of self. You have to sort through your senses of selves to see which ones are going to be useful on the path, which ones are not, and get skilled in learning how to draw on the right ones. And as the skillful ones do their work, then you can put them aside too. So look at the issue of self. How does, and this is as if you're talking about a thing. You're talking about actions, skills, or lack of or unskilled actions. But we're trying to make them more skillful. And trying to expand your repertoire of skillful selves. As for the unskillful ones, you can slit their throats. You're realizing that you don't need them anymore. That requires a lot of mindfulness and alertness and ardency, the qualities we're trying to develop as we meditate, to be on top of things so that the unskillful ones don't come back and push the skillful ones out of the way. Your old zombie selves, you don't need them. But it requires mindfulness to protect yourself. So work on your alertness, work on your mindfulness. And look at your senses of self, as I said, as actions, choices that you're making, strategies. Self is a strategy, not self is a strategy. And develop your discernment as to how to master those strategies. So your sense of self comes out and does the things that would really be helpful, and then it goes away. And you can replace it, replace it with another one and another one, as needed, and you finally get to the point where you've attained the highest happiness, and there's no need for these strategies, either self or not self anymore, at least not for the sake of that highest happiness. And from that point on, your relationship to your actions is, is very different. You, you're disjoined from your actions. In the same way that you be, would be disjoined from any action that would be a self-action or a not-self-action. But as far as your needs are concerned, you can put all those things aside. The self and not-self actions that an awakened person engages in are solely for the sake of other people. As the Buddha said, there's nothing that needs to be done, nothing that needs to be added to what has been done. No new selves need to be added. No new not-selves have to be added. That's where we're headed. But it takes a skillful use or a skillful mastery of yourselves and your not-selves in order to get there.